For decades, the fight for human rights, civil rights and equality has been driven by movements and activism across the world. What you're listening to is the anti-rape protest song Un Violador en Tu Camino, The Rapist in Your Path. Devised in 2020 by Las Tesis, a little-known South American feminist collective, it became a viral hit and was played and performed at marches around the world, from Mexico to the United States, Kenya and India, calling out judges, police and politicians for failing to protect women and girls. It shows the power of activism and how issues can be highlighted. I'm Samira Ahmed, and in this episode of We Change the Rules, we shine a light on the activism and work taking place around the world to bring about change. And when you think of activism and fighting for equal rights for women over the last 60 years, there's one name that immediately springs to mind. Gloria Steinem started fighting for women's rights in the 1960s and went on to become a nationally recognised leader of second-wave feminism in the 70s in the US. Her story has been told many times, including in the critically acclaimed Mrs. America drama starring Kate Blanchett that follows the movement to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment in 70s America. Gloria Steinem was front and centre of that movement, and I was honoured to speak to her to find out about the importance of movements and the progress that has been made since that decade. Gloria, we're talking at such a strange moment in history when it feels like the clock's been turned back on hard-won rights, and yet there's also a lot of excitement and enthusiasm in the movement for women's equality. Take me back to the, the early 70s, partly because... So many people have watched that series, Ms. America, which gave some people an insight into the battles being fought then. Could you give us an insight into what the mood was like in which you and your fellow activists began really campaigning? There was the contagion of the civil rights movement, very important. Also, the movement against U.S. involvement in a war in Vietnam. So that is contagious in itself. And the inequality of women within the society at large and often within those movements, too, then became apparent. And we began to organize and to talk about it and to include that. That's the climate against which the the women's movement kind of took off. But... Again, something that really strikes me as a woman in my 50s now talking to younger women, there's things that we take for granted about the fact that you can get a mortgage, you can hold a bank account in your own name, you can, in theory, take any job. None of these things could be taken for granted in the early 70s. And I wonder how you reflect on some of those fights, for example, not having to give up a job after becoming pregnant, which was completely routine for stewardesses, I think, or even after marriage in some cases. Yes, uh, unions especially had to, or at least progressive unions, had to fight for the right of women to be pregnant on the job and to return to work afterward. And, you know, many things, you're right, we do take for granted now. Uh, We also didn't understand comparisons. For instance, the fact that a parking lot attendant got more money for taking care of cars than a child care attendant got for taking care of children, you know, just didn't make sense. And we had to constantly point out the categories. But that's what movements are for. And there's a joy in these movements, too, you know, because there's shared purpose, there's jokes, there's (laughs) companionship. They're very magnetic. If you look back at some of the things you were fighting for in the early 70s, Have we got to where you thought we'd be now? I'm not sure what I was exactly thinking at that moment. I think mainly that it just seemed so irrational. Many of the forms of discrimination we had had that surely we would want to change it. I think I was way too optimistic. I didn't understand the source of the resistance and how economic and also socially entrenched it was. Could you actually sum up some of the key battlegrounds? Because obviously there were things like Roe versus Wade, there was abortion rights, but there were also hopes for the Equal Rights Amendment. And I I just wondered, with some of those achieved or unachieved, 
where you thought we'd be leading to by the time we look back in 50 years? Presumably you have some level, there was always a vision of when things would be better, we'd kind of know. Yes, yes, and there still is. You know, the the fact that we determine human worth and salaries by race and by gender, and the educational system is still not fully open to all. It's still, especially at the upper levels, depends on economics. You know, we're obviously still working on these things, but I do think the 60s and the 70s were a time of a great aha, you know, of a great, ah, this could be different. It doesn't have to be this way. Partly it was sometimes surprising sources like men who had served in the armed services coming home, realizing that either the service they had been in was more equal or was profoundly unequal, or so, you know, but being politicized by being there. And the women's movement, which was always centered around reproductive issues, because, of course, women have the one thing that men don't, which is a wound. So it is very exhilarating uh, to be part of a movement and discover you're not crazy. After all, the system is crazy. You raised a couple of interesting points there. One is the importance of alliances, intersectional alliances. You mentioned you know, men who came back from serving in the military and discovering they've been treated better there than they were in mainstream society, and that being part of a movement for equality. But there's also the issue of just the sheer hard graft of the work that was involved, whether it was getting petitions signed or lobbying politicians or getting women to stand for elected office. And I wonder if now, in the age of social media, when people can click on something to show their opinion, there's a danger that we don't appreciate the importance of a kind of physical turning up activism. Or is that unfair? No, I think you're right in the sense that uh, I fear we think if we clicked on something and we did it online, it's done. You know, that we actually did anything. And in fact, it didn't change the world at all. So we do need to be aware of that. The web is is crucial for community because we can discover how much support there is. We can talk to each other. But there is no substitute for physical togetherness. We actually, even chemically, we can't empathize fully with each other unless we are physically together. What makes you want to help someone who's having an accident even though you don't know that person, that, you know, empathy is not present unless you're physically together. Can I ask about the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, about the, both the global perspective and the American perspective? Because America is such a, a kind of leader in a way, in terms of the battles that are fought there tend to get covered around the world. And the fact that the Equal Rights Amendment has yet to make it into the Constitution is one of those things that we wonder what it means and how important it is. If we had the money, I would propose that we put a huge, huge billboards in every airport with international travel saying, welcome to the only country in the world, the only democracy in the world that doesn't include women in it equally in the Constitution. No, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's really outrageous. Um, and we will get there eventually. Uh, the meaning of it has been realized in some areas, but still it has to be in the Constitution. Does it worry you at all that it can feel like feminism is having to refight old battles? So uh, abortion rights, for example, in the United States. Um, but even more broadly, I mean, a country like India, where on the one hand there are strong women's movements, and yet on the other, we're seeing the enduring issues around sexual violence, as in so many countries in the world. It, it doesn't feel that that the world's regimes are making it any easier, does it? No, and I think perhaps part of the fault was ours for not understanding uh, how long it takes, how many generations it takes to really uh, change basic structures. I mean, f for instance, in families, there may still be the idea that because a woman spends nine months bearing a child that she is more responsible for that child and instead of saying, okay, the man is that much more responsible for child care. 
that we haven't really come to yet. I think the event of COVID in our lives has helped a little bit because men have been at home. They've been more likely to see, you know, what really goes into childcare. But until there is equality in the home, it won't be realized outside the home. There's a book called Sex and World Peace that points out, for instance, that violence in the home is more a cause of later wars because it justifies violence as a way of behavior than the big political issues that we think of as causing war. I don't need to tell you that the personal really is political. The, the, the connection between domestic violence and external violence, we see it in, in terrorism as well. But there's also this dilemma of sometimes it can feel like it takes legislation to change social attitudes. It certainly happened in the UK with gay marriage, for example. It was with the legislative change that social attitudes really became much more accepting of it. And, and that's had a massive impact in only a few years in Britain. And I wonder if there are any lessons there about where act activists focus should be should it be on driving legislative change you know really i think it has to be everywhere you know because we need real life examples in the home and in the street as well as legislative changes and examples so the question of where we should be active is probably more defined by where we can you know if we're in a position to work on legislative change fine if we're in a position to work on change within our households, also fine. I know voting is become a problem, certainly in some countries like the UK, where younger people can feel quite disenfranchised and COVID has had an impact as part of that. And the voter turnout is, is much lower. There are also additional factors in some countries like voter ID, which has just been introduced in the UK, which younger people are less likely to have. Do you have a view about how you overcome that sense of disenfranchisement among younger people compared to your generation where it felt the battle felt so real it was so physically active the organization required the 60s were a time that black americans were being deprived of the right to vote uh, especially but not only in the south so we couldn't fail to see how how political that was it's still a little too difficult in many cases to register to vote. And sometimes, you know, local politicians will take registration places away from campuses, for instance, because they don't want the youth vote. So we have to be constantly on guard and looking for ways to make voting easier and more accessible to everyone. What would you say, Gloria, to inspire activists of the future. I think for a lot of people, and younger women in particular, it can seem as if there are so many intractable problems, the scale of domestic violence, the scale of abuse, including on social media, which has driven women out of parliamentary life, for example, in some countries. What would you say to make women and men feel inspired to continue with the fight for equality? And I should mention, sorry, one other thing, which is the scale of pornography and that kind of violent abuse, which again, I'm surprised at how much of it there is now compared to 50 years ago. Especially pornography. I mean, porne actually means female sex slaves. So it means, right, you know, erotica is quite different. Maybe quite, it's not that our sexual information is to be repressed. It's that the inequality of pornography is the problem. And we are still trying to point that out. But it is... As usual, it means getting together with a few people, saying what we wish to change in our neighborhood or on our computers or what we're seeing, whatever it is. It just takes a few people often, and it's actually fun. It's communal. It's idealistic. It's full of humor. You make all kinds of new friends that you know, you might n never otherwise have known. I think what we don't emphasize enough is how joyous it is. I'm so glad you said that. I was just listening to you thinking about the fun and the kinship that comes with the solidarity of a movement for equality. Can you give us an insight into what 
Gloria Steinem's focus is right now? I know you must be juggling a lot of different things, but is there anything in particular that's on your campaign list right now that you're working on? Um, I have to say that my uh, house where I normally live is under construction. So I am sitting here in a friend's house. That's, uh, you know, I mean, it, it shows the importance of having friends to impose on but also just the dailiness of our lives. And, uh, you know, I think also about age. I mean, I never expected to be uh, almost 90 and, and still alive for that matter, much less still having fun doing, you know, movement work. I, I think it's helpful if we just say, okay, I'm going to do one outrageous thing every day. What is the outrageous thing that I'm going to do today? And, you know, I mean, I remember thinking, okay, I'll, I'll talk to the first person I see in the street about politics. And the first person I saw was my mailman, actually. And he turned out to be the political boss of Queens. <laughs> and so a great source of information and organizing just to, to take a chance, you know, when you're, in an elevator with a lot of other people, talk to somebody in the elevator. Just overcoming the spell that silence and custom and politeness imposes upon us and just taking a chance. That's beautifully said. Gloria Steinem, thank you so much. It was a joy to talk to Gloria and wonderful to hear her passion and enduring hopes for gender equality. She continues to inspire feminists around the world. Of course, Gloria's story is rooted in the US, but there are movements and change taking place around the world. In Mozambique in 2003, the African Union adopted what would become known as the Maputo Protocol. This was groundbreaking for African countries, a protocol that offered the potential to guarantee the rights of women if it could be ratified by at least 15 countries. And that happened just two years later and is helping drive change across Africa. Faiza Jama Mohammed is the Africa Regional Director of Equality Now. Through the use of the multisectoral approach, we are seeing collaboration among state actors as well as among state and non-state actors to facilitate access to justice for survivors of sexual gender-based violence. We are also seeing an increase in women's political participation in several countries. Laws have been adapted to address child marriage in many countries. However, implementation and application of these laws are still wanting in most countries. At the very least, countries need to invest in public campaigns, to bring change in societal attitudes, and also to be serious about enforcement of laws. Now, for the next part of this episode, we're going to speak to someone who has a track record of activism to drive change, someone who is a feminist and someone who is a man. Omar Samra is based in Egypt, a country that has seen its own Me Too movement in the last few years, with a huge amount of action being taken to bring about gender equality and opposition too. I spoke to Omar to find out about the impact of the Me Too movement in Egypt and men's role in the fight for gender equality. And through a very personal story, Omar shows how gender inequality against women and girls can impact men too. Omar, can I ask what happened in 2020? Why Egypt had this Me Too moment? I think it was a growing frustration. I think in order to be able to shed light on it, I think you have to put it into the context of the role of females and, and gender in general in, in Egypt. I think this goes back quite a lot, like even in the early 1800s during the reign of Muhammad Ali, there was a debate there, big debate whether females should be um, educated whether that was essential to national development. And ultimately, that was on the positive side. And women were very much involved in education from then on. So that's quite early on. In the early 1900s, there was over 10 magazines or so that were devoted to women's issues. There was a, an Egyptian feminist party that was founded in the early 1900s, I believe. And Egypt was the first Islamic country to basically deveil women without state intervention. So you had that, that right. And then, the, you know, the Women's Political Party was established in the early 1940s. The first female minister was in the early 1960s. But I think things took a sort of a step back. I mean, obviously, when I say these things, I think the reality is probably much more nuanced. Um, while these 
milestones that I said happened, there's quite possibly that people who lived during those eras were also complaining of vast inequality. So the trajectory was going into the right way, but there was still a lot of work to be done. Then during the Mubarak reign, I think there was some progress made over the years, but definitely not enough. There was still a lot of uh, major difficulties, a lot of taboo to talk about a lot of things. So in 2020, I can't really say what it is, but it, what it was, there was a, there was a specific case. Um, and that case was about um, an individual who had committed dozens of uh, sexual harassment incidents. And I think a lot of sexual harassment was prevalent. But I think, at least in the public domain, there was never seen anything so extreme. That one individual had committed over 30, 40 of these incidents, and it just took uh, one or two women to have the courage to come out and speak for themselves. Initially, it was anonymous, and then someone sort of revealed their own identity, and then more and more started uh, pouring in with their own stories. But, you know, there was a lot of people that were also speaking in terms of being sympathetic to the cause. And you understand, like, obviously, these types of movements, it's a very much a snowball, like, domino effect. So it was really, it was really heartwarming to see that at the time. One of the interesting things about Me Too is how much it thrives on social media. And there's always this worry that it's all very well people talking on social media, but does it really change anything? Could you give me a sense, Omar, of how this particular harassment case and the women speaking up had a genuine impact in Egypt? What were the ripple effects of it? Sure. I mean, I think this specific case was um, a gentleman who was in his early 20s. I think most of these incidents were committed, you know, during his university time or not that long after he he's someone who came from a sort of a wealthy background uh, sort of well-to-do parents and the number was shocking but also the extent of detail that became known at that point and started to come up on social media from so many different people making it hard to believe that this didn't actually happen in that way what happened was then that there were certain social media accounts the, the first one I wouldn't say, I don't know if it's essentially the first, but the most prominent ones that came in the beginning was an account called Assault Police. And it was an anonymous account. Um, we didn't know who created it at the time. And it was just, just there out there, like calling out different people. And it was doing it in a very smart way in the sense that it wasn't initially naming names unless there was somebody that was convicted of something or something st- like stuck to them because they didn't, they wanted to kind of you know, they wanted to continue to be a force of change. So they had to kind of be on the on the correct side of, of things. And it grew massively. So it was went from, you know, a couple of thousand followers to almost 200,000 followers or so in, in, a, in a very, very short span of time. And nobody knew who this assault police was or who's behind it. But it was just a force of nature. Like, um, you know, and I would imagine made at the time a lot of men who are perpetuating these crimes think, twice and three times that there is now this um, sense of shame now because a lot of the times you can do these things and if it's not put under a big lens you can kind of feel that maybe nobody will find out or the few people that will find out are also you know don't think it's a big deal Um, and then eventually uh, at some point this then motivated so many other activists and other predominantly women youth to start similar accounts And at one point as well, the person who started Assault Police revealed her own identity. And it was quite amazing to see because this account was really on point. I mean, they were posting several times a day. They were very detailed. I mean, you would think that it must have been sort of a team of lawyers or like, you know, just a very kind of experienced group of people. But it turned out to be this one student that was still in university and she was doing this, you know, in her own spare time. And obviously, you know, some... When it started to take off, like, you know, lots of her friends started to volunteer and so on. And um, Nadine Ashraf, her name was, and she, many years later, actually, when during my tenure with Equality Now, she was um, recognized f- for her work. And it's interesting to see that um, Assault Police has now sort of taken a step back. I don't think they're active anymore. But that's to say that, you know, that one account has now been replaced with dozens mm-hmm. that do effectively the same thing. So she was the catalyst. What you've identified is a sense of how particularly educated younger women seized the possibilities of social media to call out the scale of sexual harassment that was going on in Egypt, and particularly the men who might be silent enablers or going along with it, invoking this idea of shame. As a man yourself, I wonder, looking back at it three years on, and as someone who's now active in equality now, 
how far you think men have genuinely joined in the movement to fight back against this kind of issue? I think not, not very much at all. I mean, obviously, some men have stepped forward, but I think largely men feel that this is um, not their issue. I mean, some men are obviously sympathetic with the cause and some of them are sort of in the, you know, in the camp of saying, yeah, well, you know, well, well, not all men do this, this and that, that's sort of all, not all men syndrome. And that is in some ways even more counterproductive than, than just staying silent. And a lot of men still carry these archaic notions. I think for the few who are willing to speak potentially, because I remember when we, when the Me Too movement happened, at one point I got together with a friend of mine and uh, we started exploring the idea of let, let's do something. Let's, you know, do a campaign, a social campaign that could make a change. And we had this idea of, can we get a hundred women in a video to just sort of turn on their camera and say, I have been sexually harassed. Because obviously the, the data had shown that more than 98% of women had experienced some sort of sexual harassment in their lives. Uh, and if you, if you look at it as them or someone they know, it's, you know, it's, it's easily a hundred percent in all cases. So we said, we, we initially, want, want, initially wanted to emulate some aspects of the Me Too movement in the US. So we turned to celebrities and we started, you know, trying to get to different celebrities, women who were willing to say that. And then once the video was done, we reached out to all, you know, different uh, genders to, to sort of push the video as much as they could. And we were very disheartened because so many celebrities ignored us or turned us uh, down. Um, and I think it was because they feared for their own reputation. Well, can I, can I just say, Omar, and listening as a woman, that's because the shame of assault is on the women. Yeah. I mean, having having 100 men say, I've witnessed it and next time I'll speak out might be more powerful. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting way to do it. I mean, we didn't know if women would do it, but we, we had a feeling that they would. And initially, we wanted the celebrities with a lot of following to do that. Um, we ended up having sort of about 10 and then the sort of the, the initial concept of the video didn't work. And so he said, like, why don't we just extend it to, to all women? So we made a call out to any woman who would experience any form of sexual harassment that was willing to do that. And lo and behold, like within 48 hours, we got like easily over 100. Um, I mean, we were at the point where we were trying to filter, trying to create some sort of criteria of, you know, who to keep in and who to, you know, and, and it was women of, you know, all walks of life, veiled women, unveiled women. So we, we put that video together. Um, and then obviously some of the celebrities that had expressed their willingness, they were put within the campaign, you know, just like any other, other person. And that video, um, got quite popular to the extent that it was picked up by, um, a TV channel. And this was a first for us that to have a video like that of hundred women saying that on screen and that to go from social media to go to mainstream was, uh, was, a, was a win. Um, for us, and but at the same time, you know there was there was so much happening. So you know this specific case study was one of many things that were happening. Most of the things that were happening were obviously, like you said, uh, this was young, educated Egyptian women that were very social media savvy. They were very passionate about the cause that had enough, and they realized very quickly that this was the time to strike. They had to. Everybody had to double down. Um, Can I ask what's been the impact then? Have you felt that there's something is changing in Egypt as a result of campaigns like this? Because that's really what matters, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I'm always very reticent of saying like, you know, a, a massive change has happened or anything like that, because ultimately you have to look at where you want to get to. And we're still very far away from where we want to get to. But um, to say that there has been an impact, for sure there has been an impact. I think there is definitely much more fear that exists for perpetrators, you know, fearing for their reputation, they'll be found out. The public prosecutor had many, many countless incidents where they really stepped up and taken action quite swiftly. National Council for Women has been quite active in many cases. And um, it's just a, a topic that's much more in the public domain now, and it's much more acceptable to talk about. So now it's kind of a situation where the, the naysayers or the people who don't think this matters in a sort of an outing or in a public area where the, you know a bunch of people are talking about this conversation, you would be very hesitant to speak out you know, against the importance of women's rights because you'll, you know, this is, might not go down well. Whereas I would say like a few years back, you know, people would be more emboldened to say these things. But actually in terms of seeing you know, all the things that need to happen, whether it's, you know, the, all the legal barriers, the, you know, how's that affected wages, you know, so many other things I can list. Um, we're still 
you know, we're seeing some things, but we're still seeing, we, need, we still need to see so much more. Omar, um, what's really good is you acknowledge it's such a long term fight against very entrenched attitudes. I was in Egypt 20 years ago. And one of the things I was talking to women about was, you know, the scale of FGM, of female genital mutilation, and how predominant it still was in Egyptian society across all social backgrounds, despite the fact that there was all this talk about equality and, and women's progress. So there's always a gulf between the young and the advocation of women's rights and then the kind of the gatekeepers, the people who are running society, whether it's religious leaders or the court system and so on. I'm interested as well, thinking about media. We talked about social media, popular entertainment and that role. So I know that the Ramadan dramas are a big part of mass entertainment. And there was one in particular called Under Guardianship, which looked at um, the the way that property rights go to the paternal grandfather after a woman's husband dies, if the children are under 21. And I gather two MPs have actually sort of filed action in Parliament to try and bring about amendments. Can you tell me a bit about this drama and how far that's had an impact on some of the issues we're discussing? Yeah, absolutely. The show that you mentioned is um, is called Tahtel Usaya, which is translated exactly into under guardianship. Like you say, it shows uh, a woman who's had her um, husband pass away and then f- falls into all kinds of peril because the stewardship of the, of the inheritance money goes to the to the grandfather, a, a sort of a an overarching sort of male figure who then you know has the rights to make all the decisions in any sort of situation, any common sense. She should be the one making the decisions for her for her kids, and so. It's not ideal that you know the, that a TV show has to come to be able to change people's views, but again, it points to you know how much you know artists and art has a, a role to play. There are certain things that move people in Egypt quite a lot, you know, music, drama, sort of you know movies and and, and series, but also football. So you know when we were talking about you know men coming out to talk about the issue, I was you know very early on I tried to reach to a lot of footballers. Uh, because, you know, they're followed, you know, one footballer would be followed by, you know, just tens of millions, loved by tens of millions of people. So just one person coming out and saying a statement would be so simple, but just such a, so monumental, but very few actually uh, did, which was very disappointing. So the, obviously the issue of, you know, changing some things within family law, rightly so, like you, you said, is being discussed because of the the ripples that the show created. Um, and I, I know, and I always say that anything other than sort of equality down the middle, you know, hurts everybody. You know, in my own personal experience, I've, you know, I've suffered from a situation, you know, even though I'm, I'm the man here, but my wife passed away 10 years ago. And I'm so sorry. Thank you. Uh, my wife passed away 10 years ago and custody went immediately to the grandmother, my, my late wife's mother. Even though I was perfectly willing and really wanted to raise my daughter, um, it was only six years later, and not even through legal channels, but just, you know, just circumstance, I ended up being able to raise my daughter. And we obviously see the impacts that that has had on her, like in, in her psychology, her, you know, her development and everything like that. And so, you know, it really cuts both ways. In In most cases, the vast majority of cases, you can see a very you know, disproportionate unfairness towards women. But in some cases, these these laws that are not, you know, written properly, they, they, affect, they affect the men too. In this case, the father, myself, and obviously it uh, had, a, you know, a big negative impact about my, on my daughter. So, you know, these things really need to be looked at. I spoke to somebody um, in parliament recently and said that that piece of the, of the law will also be potentially taken into consideration. So we're potentially looking at a, you know, a whole sort of collection of, laws that would be reconsidered and it's about time. Absolutely. And thank you so much for being willing to share that personal story. You've raised a couple of really interesting things I want to follow up on. One is what you mentioned about trying to reach out to footballers, given how huge football is in Egypt and across the Middle East. I'm interested in what those men said to you who declined to be involved in supporting the campaign. The vast majority that I reached out to just blatantly ignored. I mean, I could see that people have read my messages. I mean, most of this was on social media. I don't have any personal relationships with famous footballers, but yeah. because I have a verified account, it was it was sometimes I, you know, I, you know, my message would pop up and people would see it and I could see that some of my messages were being read. Uh, in some cases, I reached out to people who I, who I knew that knew certain footballers very well or were close to them as friends. And again, in the majority of cases, it was like, even if I sympathize with what's happening, 
I don't want to you know mess up with this, right? And it was almost like we don't want to cause a ruckus. This is how a lot of you know athletes and footballers make their wages or make their sort of you know net worth is is through the the love and the acceptance of people. So why would I take a, a position on a topic where it could go both ways? It's just a risk that I'm not willing to take. And the same was happening with with the I suspect the same was happening with the actors because major production. Um, in Egypt is is financed by the government or by production companies that would still want to be in sort of the good books. And at the time, fortunately, the government did did actually show in many cases, like I talked about the public prosecutor and I talked about the, the Council for Women and so on, they ended up being on the right side of the of the argument and, and making some you know good progress. But it was very it was uncertain times where people just didn't want to take a risk. But I do think that still until today, I mean you were asking about specific responses. I mean, there are certain football players that came out and talked apologetically about some other football players' blatant sexual harassment that was hard to dispute. That was painful to see. I think people didn't really understand the gravity of the situation. I think now, three years on, now that it's been talked about so much more and the government has stepped in in some ways, and there's so many uh, civil society or um, social media sort of activism groups and so many other things and, uh, you know, other entities as well, like Equality Now sort of working, but also like many NGOs and people on the ground. I think that the, the, the conversation is um, is changing, but again, so, many, so much more to do. And in terms of men specifically, you've given examples of the things that you and friends have been trying to do to raise awareness and to to promote gender equality. Can you give any other examples of movements led by or focusing on men's involvement in Egypt or in wider across the region that are helping? In terms of Egypt, like I don't want to say there aren't any other movements, may well be other movements that I'm not aware of, but definitely there hasn't been a lot of movements and things that are, have been very per- pervasive and we've seen it in the public domain. It quite might possibly be that the people that are speaking out are not the people that are able to shout the loudest, and so it's it's falling on deaf ears. I can still feel it even in in private discussions, you know, with people that I know or um, in social situations. Mm-hmm. In some cases, people are not very moved by it, or if they are, think it's very wrong. It's still not my problem in a way that it's like you know, if I was in a situation that happened to me then I needed to take an action, I, I would maybe stand on the right side of history, but I'm not going to go out of my way to. And I think there's sometimes, this happens, I think, in different causes, sometimes when there's an overall sense of apathy, if a problem has been prevalent for so long, definitely we're not seeing any of that apathy among women, rightly so, but I would love to see more men, you know, jumping in. And I, and I you know, I speak for myself, some of the work that I do, with equality now is in the background, being a board member, sort of, uh, you know, weighing in on various things. But whenever there's an opportunity to chime in or to support publicly, I, 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 you know, I always take it. How hopeful are you? How optimistic are you about change and the scale of change? Um, a lot of things like changing the law, they can take a long time to work their way through the system, can't they? Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, I remember Yasmin Hassan, the former leader of Equality Now, she said in last year's gala, was, Equality Now was celebrating 30 years. And she said the founders of Equality Now 30 years ago thought that their job would be done by now, 30 years later. But like, you know, we see ourselves now, there is still another, you know, at least another 30 years ahead of us. And the challenges have just potentially increased. It's one of these things where, you know, you many days I'm I'm very unhopeful, but I understand at the same time that I, I have to be hopeful because there is... There's no other choice but to have some hope and cultivate some hope to to keep going because the situation as it stands now is not sustainable. I mean, inequality for women, a lot of people don't understand that it's it's not just a, a social and also human rights problem, which is very much is, but it's also a climate problem. It's also an economic problem. It is so many things that people are not immediately aware of. They don't understand that having more and more equality, more and more participation from women is going to be, it may just save us. The humanity is just going through very difficult times right now from, you know, the threat of AI that, uh, you know, threatens to annihilate human existence, to climate change, to refugee crisis, to so many things. And I think having equality, having enough women in leadership roles, having fair wages, having some of these 
archaic uh, laws and rules. I mean, you have certain countries now that, you know, until this day, you know, I, I started uh, talking to you by saying in the, in the early 1800s, you know, Egyptian rulers um, had this discussion and allowed women to have their education and realize that this is essential for national development. This was over 200 years ago. Now we're seeing some countries like clawing back on this. We're seeing obviously in the U.S., you know, abortion rights being curtailed. I think it's a very dangerous uh, time. I mean, having these discussions is very important. In some cases, I am very reluctant to do that because, you know, is it my place really to do that and so on? And so that's kind of my own internal dilemma sometimes when I want to speak out about things. But it's it's also been very good because it's allowed me to reflect over the years about my own privilege, uh, certain things that I take for granted, and just being an advocate and being an ally for women in this uh, movement, certainly like working with Equality Now, where, you know, like a, just an astonishing like board of really like capable women that are like forces of nature, just being around them in their own, in their orbit and just um, having discussions and them having, giving me the space to, to ask questions and so on has um, elevated my understanding. And I hope that um, is something that I can use to, to everyone's advantage. It's raised your consciousness, Omar. That's great to hear. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's the end of this episode of We Change the Rules, looking at all of the amazing people and movements that are trying to bring gender equality around the world. Some very inspiring words. In the next episode, we look to the future and find out where the hope lies for gender equality and are joined by ex-Australian Prime Minister Julia Gillard. The sexism and misogyny actually grew over time. So the longer I governed, the more there were political issues that were in contest, the more gendered insults, misogyny became a kind of go-to weapon in Australian political debate. 